Wow. That is a fish of a lifetime. Here we go, boy. Wow, we. That thing is a monster. They fight hard, don't they? Look at that magnificent fish. Look at the size of that fish. There he wow. is again. The color is incredible. Oh, there we go. The Real Fishing Show with Baba Zumi. Big old Great Lakes small boat. That is a big rainbow trout, Chris. Nice double head. Whoa. <laughs> nice jump. Yeah, <laughs> all right. That is a monster smallmouth. And that is so cool. Another one, there we go. The biggest pike I've ever caught in my life. Look at that, well, That's what we're talking about. Real Fishing is sponsored by Mercury, number one on the water, and Mystic Lubricants. On the Real Fishing Show, we make catching fish like this a possibility. Right in the middle of that, Matt. You know, folks, one of my favorite things to do is flipping and pitching for largemouth bass. And uh, that's what I'm doing today is fishing weed mats off by themselves, isolated ones, as well as um, as well as some, you know, scattered lily pads. That's a good bass right there. All right. And you know, the cool thing about it is you catch these healthy largemouth sitting in these shaded areas and uh, you know they, they love those areas because there's lots of security shade from the sun but it's also what's really key it's an ambush spot for them to sit in and uh, you know when you flip a Texas rig bait right in the middle of them it just knocks them right on the nose and we're talking about cool thing about it is they don't have to move far to get the bait Ready. Time for a new bait. This one got a little chewed up. You know, one of the things about about fishing, you know, this style of fishing, you gotta have the right equipment. And of course, uh, heavy action rods, seven, six, seven, eight, um, heavy action flipping or pitching type rods are definitely uh, the ideal situation. And uh, this fusion hook is a, is a heavy flipping hook, so it's a straight shank hook. And I'm gonna bury the point and barb right into this uh, trigger quad here, just so it's nice and weedless, you know, so I can get it into the heavy cover. Okay, so let's see if we can get another one of them babies. Just wanna give it enough of a shot to let that tungsten weight fall through. Sometimes you have to really throw it up in the air, but in this case, I'm just trying to feather it so it barely pierces those weeds and then slides right down into the cover. You know, it's so funny. One of the things is with these fish, you can play a, a cat and mouse type game. And then uh, when you're using a scented bait, I was actually feeling it. Don't, 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 you know, just sucking on the bait and putting it in his mouth, shaking his head. And that's one thing about it is a straight, soft bait made out of, you know, just plastisol, which is really, um, you know, just soft plastic versus a bait that's got something baked into it or, or cooked into it, it's so different. And uh, that's so funny because that fish was just hacking like a pan fish. And that's one thing about largemouth bass is I don't care what anybody says, they have got the most crazy personalities. They're not all the same. Some are absolutely aggressive and uh, almost not very bright. And then others are tentative and Others are just wary, you know, and that's the cool thing about bass fishing is they certainly all do have their own personality, just like other species of fish, like trout and other species. But that fish there was 
wasn't sure. It wasn't just taking it and swimming off like a big one. Get out of there, big guy. Maybe it's not that big. <laughs> That's one thing about flipping. You never know how big they are till you start seeing them wallow around on the surface. I mean, that's a nice little largemouth, but that's one thing about fishing close, uptight, and personal with flipping and pitching and catching large ones. Oh, look at that red mark on his tail there. Um, is you do get some very large bass. I mean, that's a decent little bass, but it's definitely not uh, um, not a giant. But the funny thing is when you're using a short line, heavy braid, and, and I pretty much stick to um, 50 and 65 pound braid. Now, braided fishing line, the advantage is you don't have any stretch. So it's like, you know, it's like a wire between you and the fish and uh, one of the things about it is that, that a stout fishing line like that and a heavier action rod, obviously, and is key for pulling them out of this stuff because it's really, it's hand-to-hand -hand combat when you get a hit. So it's pretty, pretty cool stuff. Okay. Coming up. <laughs> Listen to that line. <laughs> Let's take a look down under with this week's Fish Eye View, sponsored by Mercury, number one on the water. No matter what we choose to tie on our lines, the biggest concern is presentation. From a fish eye perspective, the speed of retrieve, depth, and most of all, imparted action all factor in. In effect, it's an attempt at synchronizing with the mood and feeding behavior of fish. Are they willing to chase down a meal or do they prefer an easier target? These days, fish are under more pressure than ever before. Consequently, they've become accustomed to standard fishing procedure. Even when dealing with giant top-end predators, sending the wrong message can really put them off. What we found in our underwater filming is a recent trend towards even stationary presentations, the drop shot revolution being a true sign of the times. When it comes to casting or trolling, try to emulate this effect with a slow and constant horizontal delivery. It may be difficult to maintain consistently, but take it from us, it works. By all means, start with all the old tricks that put fish in the boat for you. If the action slows down, do the same. If everything stalls out completely, follow suit. Just leave anything imaginable in place and see what happens. Yes, boat and rod movements make it difficult to stay perfectly still, but to the fish, it's something new and enticing. Get out of there, buddy. You know, one of the things is when you put your bait in this heavy cover as well, with braided fishing line, a lot of cases, you know, if you lift your rod tip an inch, your bait's moving an inch because there's no stretch in the fishing line. And so uh, what you want to do is, is, is subtly move the bait in that heavy cover. So once it punches through the mat or canopy of the lily pads you want to just lift your rod tip ever so slightly and I like to yo-yo it up and down but not I mean aggressively yo-yo it but just subtly yo-yo it to if that fish is like two three four feet away it might be in there for sometimes 30 seconds on a real tough bite and it might take that long for the fish all of a sudden to come over and gulp and eat it so a lot of times when you flip in, let it sink to the bottom, lift it up gently, let it down, lift it up gently, lower it down, and sometimes on your third or fourth lift, bang on. <laughs> A lot of times you pitch in there and they start swimming, and you don't know are they coming at you. In this case, whoa, baby. That's the other thing is I should talk about you know, I'm, I'm hoisting these fish because I'm using heavy line. And, you know, that's not a huge largemouth. Yeah, that's, yeah, nice, but it's not a giant, right? But I'm, I'm swinging these, these fish into the boat. 
and uh, one of the things is that you got to be careful about you can high stick and break a fishing rod by doing that I don't care if it's a $300 rod or a $50 rod you can break it by getting too high stick so make sure that when you swing it you keep the rod more a nice weed on my hand here more of at an angle like say at 10 o'clock or two o'clock when you swing it in to the boat and don't get high sticked if you swing a fish and your rod is at say 12 o'clock and you've got a rod sticking up and it's bent over like this you can break the tip right off it <laughs> listen to that line <laughs> That's one they hope braid that will saw through the lily pad. Wow. <laughs> that fish. That fish hammered it. <laughs> That's a little nicer bass. I got I got a little salad. Where's my bass's lip? I can feel a face in there. Okay. <laughs> That's funny. I love it when you hear that line seesawing back and forth. Now, the hook point was not even in on that fish right there. The hook point was just barely, barely in. But there's a case in point of, uh, of you know, keeping a tight line and having a rod that's a little bit more parabolic that when you set, stays bent on the fish. And I always like a flipping rod that stays loaded up. Look at that. That's a nice, healthy largemouth bass right there. When you're fishing these little weed mats like I'm doing today, it's important to approach them with the trolling motor on fairly low so that you don't spook the fish. I mean, a trolling motor on high is gonna blow out fish in say three, four, five feet of water, especially largemouth bass. So you wanna get the boat positioned properly before you make your first pitcher flip into the cover. Now in this case here, I'm pretty close to it, so I'll do a short flip to first this corner right there and I see my bait fell through, and, and this is a one ounce tungsten weight that I'm using. So it'll punch through there pretty good. Now I'll put it over about four feet over, punch it through, and I'll just let it soak there for a bit, up and down ever so gently, let it soak, nothing. Because it's so warm, the fish are pretty aggressive today, so I don't really have to let it sit in there too long. Now I'm gonna work over a few more feet. And this mat here is probably about the size of this 22 foot bass boat here, a little bit more round. But so what I'm gonna do is fish about every square yard or meter of this mat, just in case. Now, the, usually the key spot, if the wind's coming in, is right on the front face of it. Like right there is a key spot. But if they're not on the front, then I'll go back about three feet and then I'll dissect it all the way towards, towards the back. But this fit, I don't think this one has a fish in it because I haven't had a hit yet, but we'll see one last spot, that back corner. I had to give it a little bit more of a flick to get through. But once it punches through, you'll feel that bait free fall right through the mat. And that's when you know you've got a successful punch and then it's just sitting down there dangling and looking seductive to the bass. But there's not one in this mat, so we'll move on. Coming up. Yes, there is a fish in there. <laughs> Not a big one again, but it's funny. I was just about to pull it out. And that one hit. I better put the power poles down so I don't get too close. You know, it's nice to anchor down. Single biggest question I get asked about the boat in my travels is, what are those two big poles on the back of your boat? I get that asked at gas stations, boat ramps, parking lots. It's just so funny because the further north you go, you don't see as many of them, but you go down south, of course, they're very common all around the, the lakes in Florida and stuff. 
Uh oh. You gotta keep steady pressure on them. One thing about it, when you're flipping them pitching, you gotta keep the pressure on. Now, one of the things that I like to do for finding weed mats like I'm fishing today is, is to get on your chart. And so you look on your Navionics chart on the, the GPS, which shows, you know, phenomenal mapping, and is to look for any feeder creeks coming in or marshy bays in the flat. Those flats, when they've got little isolated clumps of lily pads or weed mats on them, are perfect spots on sunny days for those fish to just get drawn to. So when you look on your chart, Look for shallow, consistent flats. It might show four feet, six feet, five feet of water right across a whole area that's, you know, a hundred acres big. And then those little, small, high percentage areas can be your best bet for finding fish. Here we go. Oh, I missed him. Okay, it's a good idea when you miss a fish like that is to keep an eye on where you missed it and re-rig real quick, as quick as you can actually, and get the bait right back into the spot. There you go. <laughs> he came back. And that's what I like about this technique. You're putting it right inside their living room. And in this case, we're talking the nursery. <laughs> that, that fish is too young to have a living room. I put it back in his crib. You can always tell the little fish how they pick it up. Whoops. Yes, there is a fish in there. <laughs> this guy definitely does not know it should not hit a great big flipping bait. <laughs> yeah, that there, big guy. Well, big in a couple of years. <laughs> okay, I'm calling this 13, 14 inch big guy. That's one of the things though when you set the hook and it's, you know, such thick mat you're fishing in, a lot of times you're pulling in, hmm, I don't know, 10 pounds, of, not 10, but a few pounds of mat anyway as well, so. There we go. Coming up. Here we go. That's funny. I saw a commotion about three feet away. Here we go. Funny. I saw a commotion about three feet away from where I flipped, and it was actually this fish probably saw that bait get flipped into the middle of that pat patch and came over and just smoked it. That's a decent one. And uh, I'm sure that's exactly what happened. Boy, did this fish, this fish took it really deep. Grab the flyers. That's one thing too, is all the tools are handy here. And uh, that's one thing I spend so much time in my office. I want everything, you know, to be just right there where I can get it quickly. And uh, there we go. Nice bass, Look at that fat one too, you know, it's, uh, these fish probably spawned a month ago or so, so they're starting to fatten up pretty good. Get out of there. <laughs> Get out of there. Ski. You've heard of musky? Well, this is a bass ski. <laughs> Where are the big guys? Funny, you know, with as many fish that are under these mats, the odds of getting a bigger fish are astronomical, usually. But 
so far haven't caught a big one but you know what they're still fun because when you set the hook they all feel big until you you see their tail flashing out of out and their body and then you go okay but it's funny you know you look at a fish like that and in ontario a bass like that still a bass like that could be five to seven or eight years old like a two pound bass like that so you know you want to still put them back i do believe there is one yep. <laughs> Yep. Sometimes, you know, they hit it on the fall and you don't really know. You really don't know till you set the hook if there's a fish there or not. And that one there, look at the scar on that thing. Pike or something must be eating that guy uh, when it was younger, taking a swat at not eating it, but had it in its mouth. That's a pretty good scar. Or could be some sort of disease, but I'm not sure. Get out of there. <laughs> is there even one in there? Yes, there is. <laughs> There's a camel bass in here. There we go. That thing, that thing ran. It ran like a small fish, actually. Usually small ones like that will just run quick. Get out of there, guy. Come on. <laughs> Gotta keep the pressure on him if you're gonna get him in the boat. Don't wanna give him any pressure whatsoever. <sighs> ah, just another little large mouth. But folks, you know one thing about it is, once you get catching them by flipping and pitching like I've been doing today, you'll definitely get hooked. You gotta give it a try. Use some heavy artillery, Get yourself maybe a seven, six, seven, eight inch heavy action rod, some braided line, and go punch yourself out some hogs. See you next week. Real Fishing was sponsored by Mercury, number one on the water, and Mystic Lubricants. Let's size up, baby. That thing's got some weight to it. <laughs> size that puppy right there. That is, that is just wild. Beautiful, beautiful. Look at the size of that thing. Wow. <laughs>